Good day, my name is Ian, and we're going to be tackling the fascinating field of Euclidean geometry. Now, some of you might have a couple of hesitations about it because there's a lot of terminology, but once you nail the terminology, Euclidean geometry is fantastic. Why is it called Euclidean geometry? Well, Euclid. Euclid was a Greek who wrote a book. Well, it was a series of volumes called The Elements. And in that, he laid out geometry in a wonderful format, which made it perfectly understandable. So in deference to his work in about 300 BC, we say it's Euclidean geometry. Let's dive straight in. What we're going to be doing is we're going to be looking at our key concepts and they're going to include classifying angles, which I know some of you did last year, properties around parallel lines and the transversal line. We're going to be talking about classifying triangles, different terminology there, properties of triangles, relationships, congruency, which is shown by that symbol over there, similarity, which is shown by that symbol over there, Pythagoras, yes, another Greek, another Greek here, Pythagoras, superb mathematician, had a school of mathematics, more about him later, and we're going to talk about the midpoint theorem. Also, in our grade 10 syllabus, we have to nail the properties of quadrilateral figures, four-sided figures, quite a few of them there. So essentially, that's what we're going to be looking at today. We've got a little while, and we've got to remember that in the new CAP syllabus, Euclidean geometry is back in, all the way to matric. What we have to also remember is the format of laying out our answers. It has to be formal. A formal laying out. Statement, reason. Statement, reason. It might seem quite tedious, but that's what we need to do in order to be successful. Let's look at our first topic. Well, we're going to be classifying angles. And if I draw an angle over here and I talk about angle A1 and angle A2, the preferred way of writing it is angle A subscript 2 for that one over there. And obviously, subscript 1 for this one over here. Acute angles, greater than 90, but less, greater than 0, but less than 90. So something like that over there. Let's call that angle B1. So angle B1 will be acute. Terminology, a right angle, a right angle is equal to 90, shown by a little square in the angle. And I want to tell you that you need to look at the diagrams carefully. Often, there will be a description of what's happening in the diagram, and it will say angle C is a right angle, for example. But often there won't be a description, and you need to recognize all the symbols. So that's why I'm going through them carefully. Let's carry on. An obtuse angle, anything bigger than 90, so perhaps something like that. A straight angle, yep, there's a straight angle, equal to 180 degrees. A reflex angle, slightly bigger than 80, but less than 360, for example there, or for example, there. Sometimes we ask to find the reflex angle, not the obtuse angle. You've got to be careful about that. So read the question and understand the terminology. Carrying on. A revolution, the sum of angles around a point 
is 360. So adding all those up together, we get 360 degrees. Writing it formally, let's say those were the angles A, around point A, angle 1, 2, 3, and 4. We'd say that angle A1 plus angle A2 plus angle A3 plus angle A4 is equal to 360 degrees. What we might like to do is use the abbreviation REV for revolution. Now, here we come on to some other terminology which you may or may not have heard of yet and it also has to deal with parallel lines. When you've got parallel lines and they cut by transversal, what's going to happen? These ones talk about the positioning of the angles with regards to the lines in the diagram. Let's have a look at the terms. Adjacent angles. If two angles are adjacent, they share a vertex. So angle A1 and angle A2 share a vertex. And they also share this common arm, which I'm going to scribble over in green. In other words, there's the one angle and there's the other angle. They share a vertex and they have a common side or a common arm. If we look at vertically opposite angles, they are opposite each other. So in this case, angle B1 and B2 are vertically opposite. They share a vertex and they're equal. So what can I summarize this little diagram to say? B1 is equal to angle B2 and the abbreviation I might like to use is vert op. It's actually lovely having a couple of abbreviations because then we don't have to write vertically opposite. We write vert op. Just like some others that I'm going to show you shortly. Now, here we have two that really, being senior high school kids, we have to use. Back in the old days, when you were in grade 8 and grade 9, and you said, but sir, the angles add up to 180 degrees. Yes, in senior high, we say, sir, they're supplementary. Means the same thing. It's just a grown-up way of saying they add up to 180. The angles are supplementary. So if we have a straight line, for example, and we hang, have angles F1 and the angle F2, we can say F1 plus F2 equals 180. Why? Because they are supplementary. And similarly, Complementary adds up to 90. That is a term that you probably will use more when you are doing trigonometry, when you get two angles adding up to 90. They complementary. Remember, we are now senior high school kids. We use the correct terminology. Now, I know that's a lot to digest, and I know that a lot of you already have these terms under the belt. So, let's move on. If we talk about parallel lines and a transversal, well, parallel lines are always the same distance apart. We indicate they're parallel with arrows, either single arrows or double arrows. A transversal cuts the parallel lines. All it does, it just smashes across the train tracks. There it goes, our transversal we may have more than two parallel lines. For example, those three pink lines are parallel, and here comes our green transversal. Now, why do we even bother with that? Because when a transversal cuts parallel lines, there are three amazing properties. Let's do them. Well, before we actually look at the properties, we have to look at what are interior angles. 
They're angles that lie between the lines. So, for example, that and that would be interior. Exterior angles would be lines that lie outside the parallel lines. For example, that one over there and that one over there. We could also have this one here and that one there. They are exterior angles. They're lying outside. Now, corresponding angles. Need to remember that word, corresponding angles. They are angles that lie on the same side of the lines and on the same side of the transversal. In other words, that over there and that over there. And yes, they make an F shape. So corresponding angles make an F shape. Let's look at cointerior angles. Cointerior angles, another term that we need to remember, between the lines and on the same side of the transversal. Well, if I have two parallel lines there and my transversal over there, my cointerior angles will be over there and over there. Also, this set of angles there and there will also be co-interior. Now, what kind of a shape does that make? Well, that could make a U-shape. So co-interior angles make a U-shape because the angles lie between the lines and on the same side of the transversal. Moving on to our third and last one, alternate interior angles. Well, there we have our parallel lines, there we have our transversal, and interior angles that lie inside the line and on opposite sides of the transversal. So, making that slightly clearer here with pink, there and there. Between the parallel lines and on either side of the transversal. And yes, you guessed it, there's another set over there and over there. Right? What kind of a pattern does that make? Well, I think it makes a N. Alternate interior angles make an N shape. And you know what that spells? Well, corresponding angles was an F. Co-interior angles was a U. And alternate interior angles was an N. And yes, that makes geometry a lot of fun. Right. What we've done is we've talked about the position of the angles. Now, what is very special about these angles is if the lines are parallel. There are three really crucial bits of information that pop up. If the lines are parallel, then something's going to happen. Now, before I show that to you, let's just look at the structure of that sentence. If, then. If a condition happens, the lines are parallel, then out is going to pop a property. Let's go and have a look at them. If the lines are parallel, then the corresponding angles will be equal. The co-interior angles will be supplementary. Yes, adds up to 180. And the alternate interior angles will be equal. Now, what does that mean for us? Well, our F shape, those two angles will be equal. Our U shape, those two angles will be supplementary. And our N shape, those two angles over there will also be equal. Only if the lines are parallel, then we get fun with our parallel lines. So, let's reiterate. If the lines are parallel, we get three wonderful things happening. Corresponding angles equal, 
co-interior is supplementary and alternate interior is equal. I can really hear some of you saying, how do we test if lines are parallel? Well, let's look at the statement and see if we can switch it around. If the conditions hold, if the conditions hold, will the lines be parallel? You're absolutely correct. This statement goes both ways. So, I've written it out here. Let's have a look at it. If the corresponding angles are equal, or if the co-interior angles are supplementary, or if the alternate angles are equal, then the lines are parallel. Just a quick little example on this one over here. For example, I want to find, is line AB parallel to CD? This angle over here is 100 degrees. This angle over here is 100 degrees. Are the lines parallel? Well, we've got two angles that are equal. And those are alternate interior angles. Yes, they make the N shape. They are equal. So therefore we can say the lines are parallel. So what I've done is I've gone through the theory, some of which you've done already. This might be a little bit new to you. I'm going to do four examples. Remember what I said at the beginning? We need to learn to set our work out formally. It seems a bit of a drag. Why do we have to give reasons? Well, we senior high. We have an argument that is correctly formatted. Just like we do in debating or in English. Exactly the same we've got to do in maths. So let's go and have a look at a couple of the examples. Calculate the size of the angles marked with small letters. First of all, we can see that that is a straight line and we could work out x using 49 plus x gives us 180 degrees because straight line supplementary. Very good. We could then work out y a couple of different ways. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start off by saying 49 degrees plus x equals 180 degrees and my reason y is straight line. Therefore, we can have x. And yes, what is x going to be? Well, 180 minus 49 is going to give us 131 degrees. We found x. How are we going to work out y? Well, some of you might say, let's do it on a straight line. We've got x, let's do it on a straight line. Absolutely correct. And this is what makes senior high so much better than junior high. There are lots of different ways to do exactly the same thing and get it right. Now, instead of using straight lines and the supplementary angles, I'm going to use vertically opposite. I'm going to say that 49 degrees is equal to y. Why can I say that? Because they are vertically opposite. And there we go. We have found the value for x and we found the value for y. The reason I specified the value is if someone were to say find x, you just circle it say there it is. So make sure that your teachers ask the questions correctly. Calculate the size or find the magnitude of the angle, something like that. All right, let's do number two. Calculate the size of the angles marked with a small letter. Well, there it is. What information am I given? I need to realize that those two little arrows tell me the lines are parallel. I can therefore have a look and say, what shape is this? Yes, there we go. It's an N shape. The N for fun. 
So I can say that x is equal to 70 degrees, but what is my reason? Alternate interior angles is my reason. Right, I found the size of the angle. Let's have a look at the next one. Calculate the size of the letters marked with the size of the angle marked with small letters. Once again, we have to realize and read that that means the lines are parallel. So, what shape have I got here? Well, yep, you guessed it. There's my F shape, my F for fun. I know it's sitting upside down. Well, so be it. So I can say that x is equal to 70 degrees. What is the reason? Corresponding angles. Whoops. And my spelling is letting me down for a second. So let's redo that. Corresponding angles. Corresponding angles. There we go. On to the next one. Calculate the size of the letter marked, the size of the angle marked with small letters. Well, I'm sure you've realized I've used the F, I've used the N, here comes the U. Well, you're absolutely correct. Here we go. There we go, the U shape, and yes, the lines are parallel. If they parallel, we can say that 100 degrees plus X is equal to so 180 degrees. Why? Because it's co-interior angles. And that is the recognized abbreviation, co-int. So what is x equal to? Well, x is equal to 80 degrees. Fairly straightforward. One other thing I need to really emphasize is because we're working in degrees, we've got to put the little degrees sign there. I don't know if you know, but there are four different ways of measuring angles. Just like length, we could have yards or miles or meters or inches. So with angles, we could have degrees or radians, even gradients, and in the military, we use mills. So, if we use degrees, we've got to put the little degree sign there. I wouldn't want you to lose unnecessary marks by not doing that. Let's move on. What we're going to do now is we're going to classify a couple of triangles. Now we all know that a triangle is a three-sided closed planar figure. Oh, that sounds quite complicated. Well, three-sided triangle, closed because it's closed, it's not open, planar because it's on a single plane. It's not a three-dimensional object, it's a two-dimensional object. There we have it, triangle, a three-sided closed planar figure. Now I've just taken four different classifications and I'll chat about a couple variations. Here we go. The first one is a scalene triangle. All three sides are different, so no sides are equal. And what we can see is that notation indicates to us that none of the sides are equal in length. I know that I could have an acute angled scalene triangle where all three angles are acute, in other words, all three are less than 90 degrees. I know that I could have a right angled scalene triangle. And I also know where I could have an obtuse angle scalene triangle, with that angle there being obtuse. So essentially, there are three variations on a scalene triangle. But the most important thing is scalene, no sides are equal. Well, what happens if two sides are equal? Here we go, 
We call it an isosceles triangle. Two sides are equal, and the angles opposite the equal sides are also equal. Be careful about using that term over there. I know it appears in your textbook, but what I'm going to show you now is an isosceles triangle that sits like that. Well, which angles are equal? Yep, that one over there and that one over there. Those would be the two equal angles. Now, what happens if we have three sides equal? We get an equilateral triangle. All three sides are the same length. And as a consequence, all three angles are also going to be equal. 180 divided by 3, 60. Now that property came up last year in a trig paper, paper 2 in matric. And it had an equilateral triangle. It didn't say the angles were 60 degrees. And if you knew that property, the question is quite easy. So please keep in the back of your mind, if you see an equilateral triangle, you know, automatically, as if by magic, the angles are all 60 degrees. 60 degrees there, 60 there, and 60 there. The last one that I'm going to classify as, triangle as, is a right angle triangle. One interior is 90, and I know that you know why only one interior can be 90. Because the other two have to sum to 90. The other two angles are corresponding. And this right angle triangle forms the basis for the trig you're going to be doing later this year. Or perhaps have already done. How do I know it's a right angle triangle? Remember a little while ago when I said a right angle? How did I show it? I showed it with a little square in the corner. There it is. There's our little square in the corner. I'll rub it out so you can see it. You know automatically that that means that angle is 90 degrees. Let's move on. Having a look at some of the properties of triangles. Now, there are three properties of triangles we're going to discuss. Three that you need to know in grade 10 and you will carry this knowledge through into grade 11 and 12. The first one is the sum of angles of a triangle. And I know that a lot of you know how to do it, and I know that you know that it adds up to 180 degrees. Oh, we're not allowed to use that term, we're senior high. They are supplementary, dude. A, B, and C are supplementary. On our diagram, A, B, and C are supplementary. Having a look at the second property. The exterior angle of a triangle is equal to the sum of the opposite two interior angles. The exterior angle of a triangle, angle C, outside, is equal to the sum of A and B. Exterior angle of a triangle is equal to sum of the interior opposite two angles. Those are the two properties that are really straightforward. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to do one or two examples using those properties and then we're going to go on to the third properties of a triangle that I want to discuss with you today. Question A. Calculate the size of the angles marked with small letters. Well, here we go. That shows us that this is an isosceles triangle. That angle and that angle are equal. So I can say straight away, 80 degrees is equal to X isos triangle. Remember what I said about your textbook saying base angles? Well, here's an example where it's not the base angles, but it's angles opposite the equal side. That's why I drew, you, drew your attention to that. Let's have a look at the last part of this question. Here we're still looking for the angle Y. Now, 
It's three angles in a triangle. And I've got that this one is already 80 degrees. So I could say that 80 degrees plus 80 degrees plus y is equal to 180 degrees because interior angles of a triangle are supplementary. Well, 180 plus 80 gives me 160, so y is equal to 20 degrees. Now you'll notice that I'm using a reason. I always give reasons, and I'm using abbreviations for the reasons. So it makes life a little bit easier for us. Always, always, always give reasons. Okay, deal. Let's try the next one. Calculate the size of the angles marked with small letters. What I have here is I have an exterior angle of the triangle. Well, I know. Exterior angle of a triangle is equal to the sum of the opposite interior angles. And I give my reason, exterior angle, triangle. So in this case, x is equal to 70 degrees. Now, I know that some of you would prefer to work out the interior angle using supplementary angles of a triangle, and then work out the x using straight line, properties of a straight line, and that's fine. Give your reasons. It might be slightly longer, but if that's what you're comfortable with, it works. It's absolutely okay. The last thing I want to do is to talk about the theorem of Pythagoras. Now, as I mentioned earlier, Pythagoras was a Greek. He had a school of mathematics. Yep, all they did was maths. How did they know that people belonged to the school? No, they didn't wear uniforms. What they did was they had a pentagram tattooed on their palm. Now where was the school? It was on the island of Patmos, there in the Aegean Sea. Beautiful. And they sat around and they talked about politics, they talked religion, they talked mathematics. And it was one day that a question was posed that gave rise to this theorem. It caused quite a lot of trouble as well, but we won't worry about that now. Let's have a look at it. If we start with any triangle ABC, and I'm going to leave the script out and I'll fill it in myself. AB squared plus BC squared is equal to AC squared. And that's what the theorem of Pythagoras tells us. I would really like you to give yourselves a challenge and learn the theorem of Pythagoras. It's really just a nice thing to have. It might impress some of your classmates. Here it goes. In any right angle triangle, the square of the hypotenuse is equal to the sum of the square of the other two sides. Now, you heard me use the word hypotenuse. That is the side opposite the 90 degree or the right angle. So in the diagram we've got over here, this side over here will be the hypotenuse. Now, I'm going to draw another diagram and let's see if you can write the theorem of Pythagoras correctly. I'm going to call that x. I'm going to call that y, and I'm going to call that r. Okay, the square of the hypotenuse, hypotenuse side opposite the 90. The square of the hypotenuse is equal to the sum of the squares of the other two sides. And there we have another version of Pythagoras' theorem written out for you. Now, if any of you have borrowed an elder brother or sister or cousin's formula sheet in matric, 
you'll see that formula on the formula sheet. And that's the formula for a circle. If we were going to draw a circle on a Cartesian plane, that's the formula. Now, a couple of really, really interesting things about Pythagoras' theorem is in the building trade, if you need to get a right angle triangle, you could use a piece of rope, which is 3 plus 4 plus 5 meters long. Well, 3 plus 4 plus 5 gives us 12 meters long. And if you bent it so that one side was 3 and one side was 4 and the other side was 5, this angle between the 3 and the 4 would always be a right angle. Not just sometimes, always, always, always. So what are these special numbers 3, 4, 5? What is that special ratio called? It's called a Pythag triple. Triple because it's three numbers. Pythag because it fits in the ratio of Pythagoras' theorem. Square of the hypotenuse is equal to sum of the square of the other two sides. Right. Let me prove that to you. If I have 5 squared, that gives me 25. If I have 3 squared plus 4 squared, that gives me 9 plus 16, which is also 25. So what I've done is I've shown the square of the hypotenuse, there's a hypotenuse, is equal to the sum of the squares of the other two sides. There they are, 25 and 25 equal. Some of you might be thinking, that's amazing. But is that the only set of numbers that forms a Pythagorean triple? Well, if I could be honest with you, there are an infinite number of variations. Not all Pythag numbers are, rash are integers, but Pythagorean triples are all. And I'm going to show you a couple of really, really popular ones. If you memorize these, 3, 4, 5, and the other two I'm going to show you, you will find work a lot easier because then instead of having to do the calculation, you know automatically. Right angle triangle, and so therefore 3, 4, 5, and you can work out the missing side. Let me show you the pattern and how it develops. We start with 3, 4, 5, and we know that 5 squared is equal to 3 squared plus 4 squared. If I take the number 5, 12, 13, that also forms a Pythagorean triple. Why? And please get out your calculator and double check this because 13 squared is 5 squared plus 12 squared. How about another one? How about 7? Well, 7, 24, 25. Why? I know, and you're going to check me on the calculator, 25 is equal to 7 squared plus 24 squared. Now maybe you can see a pattern developing, and I know that you've done patterns in grade 10. I'll give you a couple of hints and see if you can work this out for yourself. This list goes on forever. Might be a nice challenge to see who can memorize the most Pythagorean triples. Make it a competition in your school. What is happening with these numbers here? 3, 5, 7. Well, they're all odd numbers. These numbers are all consecutive. 24, then 25. 12, then 13. 4, then 5. But how do I know where to start? Well, here's the trick. If I take 7 squared, that's 49. And two consecutive numbers adding up to 49 are 24 and 25. 
Yes, 7 squared is 49. Half of 49, less a half, 24. Half 49 plus a half, 25. There's a Pythagorean triple. Last one. 9. 9 nines are 81. Half of that minus a half will be 40. Half of that plus a half will be 41. Yes, there is another Pythagorean triple. And this is another unique Pythagorean triple. You can generate as many as you like. And this is only one way of generating unique Pythagorean triples. But I thought it quite cool to show you. What we're going to do now is take a short break. Maybe you'd like to generate a couple of Pythag triples by yourself. Or go and stretch your legs, have a drink of water, and we'll be back in a few minutes. Welcome back from your break. I hope you generated a couple of Pythag triples. Now, here we go on to the next section. It's called congruency. And after that, I'm going to do similarity. Now, congruency means equal. Equal in every respect, size and shape. Let's have a look. Well, I've got th four rules. Rule one tells me that if two triangles are congruent, if the three sides of one triangle are equal to the three sides of another triangle, that, tri ang that side over there and that side over there are equal, that side and that side over there are equal, and that side and that side over there are equal. Now, can you remember what the symbol for congruency was? Well, just like an equal sign, but with a third little one. And I call it very, very equals. Absolutely equal in size and shape. So rule one was SSS. Let's have a look at rule two. Two triangles are congruent, very, very equals. If two sides and the included angle are equal to two sides and the included angle, what that means is that that angle over there has got to be included between the two sides, just as it is over there. Now, how do I remember the acronym SAS? And why can't I mess it around? Well, don't mess with the SAS. For those of you who know, that's the Special Air Service. That was Britain's premier counterinsurgency unit. Established 1940. Really, really hardcore guys. Don't mess with the SAS. And I've used that as one of the properties of congruency. Let's go to number three. Number three says... Two triangles are congruent if two angles and one side are equal to two angles and one side of the other triangle. Well, in this case, the side is included. It doesn't have to be included. And that's why SAA, you can do it anyway. So you could have the side opposite one of the angles and of angle, angle side. It doesn't have to be side, angle, side, angle. SAA goes anyway. The last rule is RHS. Two right angle triangles, so a right angle triangle, are congruent if the hypotenuse and one other side of the triangle are equal to the hypotenuse and another side of the other triangle. There's our one side and its corresponding partner. There's the hypotenuse opposite our 90, and there's our 90, making it a right angle triangle. So, to summarize, for congruency, you need SSS, SAS, SAA, and RHS. Side, 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 side angle, side, side angle, angle and right angle hypotenuse and one other side. Now, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to prove two triangles congruent. Just listen to what I said there. I said prove. I'm not just going to say like, dude, they like, look like the same like. 
I'm going to prove it formally. And remember now in Euclidean geometry, of which this is a part, we have to prove things formally. So here comes the question, watch the layout, you are going to need to do this as well. There we have a diagram, and I need to prove triangle ABC is congruent to triangle ADC. So ABC, the triangle on the left, is congruent to the triangle on the right. Well, it's not right angled, so I can't use RHS. I've only got one side at the moment, so there's no ways I'm going to be using SSS. Could I be using SAS? Perhaps. Could I use SAA? Well, I've only got one angle that is equal in one and one angle in the, in the other, so I don't think I'm going to. Let's have a look at the diagram. I've got that side over there equal to that side over there. I've got that angle equal to that angle over there. And oh my goodness, how about this side here? It's common. It appears both in the right-hand triangle and in the left-hand triangle. So I could use SAS to prove these two triangles congruent. So let's do it. I'm going to talk about in triangle ABC and triangle ADC. Those are the two triangles. Remember, a formal proof. I've got that AB is equal to AD. And that was given to me. I've also got that angle a1 is equal to angle A2. And that was also given to me. And just extending the page there, I've got that side AC in the left hand triangle is equal to side AC in the right hand triangle, and that is common. It is a common side. Right, what have I got? Well, I've got a side in one equal to a side in the other, an angle in one equal to an angle in the other, and a side in one equal to a side in the other. I've proved congruency, SAS. All I'm going to do now is just finish off my proof. What I can say is, therefore, triangle ABC is congruent to triangle ADC, reason, side angle side. And there is what is known as a formal proof. It's statement, reason, statement, reason, conclusion. Okay, the layout is very important. Please make sure you follow that. Let's move on. What we're going to look at now is similarity. And some of you will remember that similarity is parallel line with an extra little bit. Now there are two conditions for similarity. Two conditions. One of them is all the angles are equal in one triangle to all the angles in a second one. That's the first rule. And the second one is if I have three pairs of proportion sides, three pairs of sides that are in proportion in both triangles, then they are similar. I know that your textbook says SSS. I've never used that. I'll explain as I go along. Let's have a look. If all three pairs of corresponding angles of two triangles are equal, then the triangles are similar. Now, what does that actually mean? Angle A and angle A, angle B and angle B, angle C and angle C. What that means is the two angles are exactly the same in shape. One might be a little triangle and one might be a big triangle. How about circles? All circles are similar. You've got little circles and big circles. The shape is the same. That's what similar means. 
Similar means the shape is the same. Is there another figure you can think of, whether it's small or big, that the shapes are identical? How about a square? Every square is similar to every other square. Let's go back to triangles and similarity. Rule two, if all three pairs of corresponding sides are in proportion, then the triangles are similar. Now this means I need to take the length of that side over the length of that side to give us a fraction. I need to take the length of that side over the length of that side to give us a fraction. And I need to take the length of that side over the length of that side to give us a fraction. And if those proportions are equal, then the triangles are similar. So I call that the 3PE. Three proportions equal. You might like to make up your own three-letter acronym to help you with that. So, let's have a look at an example. Consider the diagram below. Is, we have to prove similarity, triangle ABC similar to triangle DEF? Now, I know that those lines are absolutely vertical, and my lines are slightly more forward slash-ish, but they mean exactly the same thing. Depending on which text you read, and depending on word processing package you use, if you type, depending on how your lines are going to look. But those three lines next to each other means similar. So, how am I going to use, how am I going to do this? Well, let's have a look at 32 over 18. And let's have a look at 64 over 36. Well, I know that we can simplify this. Okay, let's use our calculator. Grab a calculator, 32 over 18, that gives me 16 over 9. Going back over here, that is 16 over 9. That's the proportion of that side over that side. Let's have a look at the next one. Double checking it with our calculator. 64 over 36. Yes or no? Yes. Fantastic. That is 16 over 9. Because the sides are in proportion and those proportions are equal, those two triangles are similar. So we can say here that Triangle ABC is similar to triangle DEF, and we can say sides are in proportion. Once again, I'm giving my reasons. I've done my calculation, I've made my conclusion, and I'm giving my reasons. Let's move on. This is a challenge question. I know that this isn't in your syllabus, and this is slightly extending you, but see if you can do it. I want you to calculate the value of A and B. B is the entire length, TQ, and I've got B over 4 over there. On the other side, I have A, which is that length, TR. Now, you might or might not have done the midpoint theorem, and that's okay, but this isn't the midpoint theorem. This is a challenge question. So, what we're going to do is we're going to have a look at B over 4. What does B over 4 actually mean? Well, it means a quarter B. B over 4 is the same as a quarter B. Now, if the whole length is B and that little bit up top is a quarter B, how much is this bit over here? Yes, I can hear you say it, three quarters B. And three quarters B is equal to nine. 
So, how much is B equal to? Yep, you've got it. B must be equal to 12. How about the value for A? Well, because they're parallel lines, the sides are going to be in proportion. The little triangle up at the top and the big triangle are similar because of those two parallel lines. So the sides are going to be in proportion. So I've got 15 at the bottom and I've got A at the top. Same proportion as the other side. Let's have a look at it. Over here we had 3 quarters to a quarter or 3 to 1. So 15 to what is going to be the same as 3 to 1? You got it. A is equal to 5. How about that for a challenge question? A little bit different. That shows where similarity can be used and the proportion that arises from similarity can be used. Let's have a look at the midpoint theorem. The line joining the midpoints, there's the midpoint, that shows us that that bit is equal to that bit, of two sides, there's the midpoint over there, that bit over there is equal to that bit over there. So what I've got is if I've got a line joining the midpoint of two sides of a triangle is parallel to the third side and equal to half the length of the third side. What does that mean to us? If this is 5 units in length, this here will be 10 units in length. And that there will be parallel to that. How about that for a funky result? You take any triangle, find the midpoint, find the midpoint, join it. That line is going to be parallel to the third side. And not only parallel, it's going to be half the length of the third side. Now that's a really amazing result. Something so simple. Join the two midpoints, parallel to the third side and half the length of the third side. Let's keep going. Here's a question which uses the midpoint. There we go. M is 90. It is given to us. We can also see it on the diagram. S is the midpoint of MN. Here, in a case like this, not only must you read the statement, but you've got to put those, that explanation on your diagram so you can see what's going on. They tell us S is the midpoint, so I'm going to indicate it with little lines that SM is equal to SN. Let's have a look at the diagram. S is the midpoint, so MS is SN. They tell us that T is also a midpoint. So that little bit over there is equal to that little bit over there. Oops, I did one too many stripes there. Now what does that give us? What I will do when I actually do these examples, I take a piece of paper and I blank it out so that I see just the piece of the diagram that I want. Oh, have a look here. Midpoint, midpoint joined. Goodness me, this line is going to be parallel to that line. If they parallel, and I extend and I look at this whole thing, what does it mean for you? And that's what we have to do in part A. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to write this up. I'm going to say in triangle M, N, R, so that I know which triangle I'm talking about. S is midpoint of MN. T is midpoint of NR. Now, how do I know that? They were given to me in both cases. What is my conclusion? I can say that ST is parallel, let's just get the line, to MP. Why? Midpoint theorem. 
Now, what does that mean for us? If it's parallel, u over here must also be the midpoint. If the lines are parallel and it comes from one midpoint, it's going to go to another midpoint. So therefore, u is midpoint of NP. And I'm using the midpoint theorem here as well. Quite a wonderful result. The question goes on. And remember, we got that equal to that. We got that equal to that. We've got this line parallel to this line. And we've just proved that u was the midpoint. So I can fill in all those bits and pieces. They say to us, if st is 4 units, or 4 centimeters, and s in triangle SN and the area of triangle SNT is 6, calculate the area of MNR. They're telling me this little triangle over here, the area is 6. Now have a look over here. This is a wonderful result. Because these two lines are parallel, that's going to be a right angle over there as well. Corresponding angles. Remember our F shape. I'm just going to erase bits and pieces over here and rewrite them so that I have a clean slate to work with. We said that that was 4. We said that that was a right angle. We know that those two lines are parallel and that S is the midpoint of that. Okay, let's have a look. I've got to work out the area of MNR. I've got 4 and I've got the area of this, but I don't have the length, Sn. So let's work that out first. We know that the area of triangle SNT is equal to 6 centimeters squared. It's also equal to half times the base times the height. Our base is given to us as 4 and our height is Sn. We don't know that. But we can work that out really, really quickly, can't we? Yes, we can. Sn is equal to 3 centimeters. Now, let's go back to our diagram. If Sn is 3 centimeters, Sm must also be 3 centimeters. That's quite easy. There's our right angle. If that is 4, how much is this going to be? Remember, it's double. Quite easily. Y is MR 8 units. Remember our midpoint theorem? If it's parallel, it's half the length of the other side. So if ST is 4, MR must be 8. So what have I got? I've got 3 and 3 to add up 6. I've got 8 over there and I've got a right angle. Easy. I can work out the area of the triangle. So my area of triangle MRN is equal to a half times, times my base times my height. My base was 8, which I got with my midpoint theorem, and my height is going to be 6. So there we go. That gives us 24 centimeters squared. And I've worked out the area of triangle MNR. Now, in question C, they say prove that the area of MNR will always be four times the area of SNT. This big triangle over there will always be four times the size of the little one inside. And we've got to prove it. They've been really nice and they've given us a hint. They told us to let ST be X and SN be Y units. Now, if we remember what we proved a few moments ago, we proved S, or we were given that S was the midpoint. If that is Y, SM must also be Y. And using our midpoint theorem, if ST is X, MR is 2X. Yes, double the size. 
filling it in on my diagram. That there is going to be y, and that there is going to be 2x. Right, let's work out the area of triangle MNR. That's my baby little triangle. Sorry, that's my big triangle. MNR will be a half times 2x times 2y. A half times 2x times 2y. And what does that give us? That gives us 2xy. Let's have a look at the area of the little triangle, which is STN. Well, STN is equal to a half times its base times its height, x times y, which is a half xy. Now, what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to rewrite the one on the left-hand side, and I'm going to say that is 4 times a half xy. What can I say is my conclusion? That is the area of our little MNR, sorry, of our little SNT, and that is the area of our big MNR. Therefore, the area of triangle MNR is equal to four times the area of triangle SNT. Now, that result wouldn't have been possible if we hadn't had the midpoint theorem. Midpoint gave us the two sides that were equal, and it also gave us that the little triangle was half the length of the base of the big triangle. We're going to take a quick ad break, and when we come back, we're going to conclude the section with properties of quadrilaterals and one or two examples around that. <laughs> Hi, and welcome back. As I said previously, here we go back with properties of quadrilaterals. Please make sure that you learn these. Yes, I know it's boring. Please learn the properties off by heart. So if I ask you to prove that one quadrilateral is a square, you know how to do that. Quite essential that you remember this all the way up to and including matric. Let's have a look at properties of quads. Now, the first one that I've decided to select is a trapezium. The most simple quadrilateral, quadrilateral, four sides, the most simple trapezium that is defined. Two sides are parallel. That side, parallel to that side. And that's it. One property, that's it. Trapezium. I then have a look at a parallelogram. Now, a parallelogram has a multitude of properties. What does a parallelogram mean? Well, parallelogram means, and how we define it, is both pairs of opposite sides are parallel. From that, you can extract lots of different things, and working through examples will really help you understand the nuances of properties of a palm. Parallelogram, we could write as palm for short. So parallelogram, we could write as palm. Well, the opposite sides are parallel and equal. And that would be one way to prove that it is a parallelogram. We could use that property as a proof. Opposite interior angles are equal. That one equal to that one, and that one over there equal to that one over there. And we could use that property also as a proof. Diagonals, in other words, the, angle, the lines going from A to C, this diagonal that cuts the way through the middle, and the other diagonal from B through to D, they bisect each other. They cut each other in half. And that's another way that we could prove that a quadrilateral is a palm. 
But all these properties, you need to know. Because if I say it's a palm, you need to know the properties. Let's have a look at a rectangle. Now, a rectangle is a special palm. In fact, it's a palm with one interior at 90. All right? Opposite sides are parallel and equal in length. Exactly the same as in a parallelogram. Diagonals, however, are equal in length. The line AC is equal in length to the line BD. They also bisect each other just as they did in a palm. And the interiors are right angles. Carrying on, we get a rhombus. A rhombus. Now, a rhombus, some people call a squashed square. Why is it a squashed square? Because all four sides are equal in length. But it also has a multitude of really interesting properties. Opposite sides are parallel, just as we had in the palm. And it's not shown on this diagram, but those sides are parallel. Opposite sides are parallel. All the sides are equal in length. And that is what I was saying about it being a squashed square. All sides are equal in length. But the most important thing about a rhombus is the diagonals bisect at right angles. That's a hugely important thing. And what's really cool as well is that it, the diagonals bisect the corner angles. So there we go, a really colorful rhombus. A square, a square the purest of all our, parallel, our quadrilaterals. The opposite sides are parallel. The diagonals are equal in length. The interior angles are all right angles over there. The bisecting angles are all 45. There our diagonals cut each other and they bisect each other. The purest of all our quadrilaterals. Then the last one that I'm going to discuss with you is a Kite. You have a major diagonal. That there is your major diagonal. And similarly, the little one over here will be your minor diagonal. Right angles and adjacent sides. Sides next to each other are equal in length. So those two are equal in length, and those two are equal in length. Only the minor diagonal is bisected over there. Now, guys and girls, these are the properties of quadrilaterals. And please put your mind to it. Go and learn the properties of quadrilaterals. It's really easy if you draw them and fill in all the properties. Make a game of it. Test the team. What I'm going to do is I'm going to do four examples now using these properties. Let's go on. The first question is using the information provided on the diagram, prove that AD is parallel to BC. I've got to prove that AD is parallel to BC. Well, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to say that angle C plus angle B is equal to 180 degrees. Why? Because co-interior angles are equal. Sorry, they're not equal. They're supplementary. And why can I say that? Because side AB is parallel to side DC. X, therefore, is equal to 60 degrees. This angle over here, 60 degrees. Why? Because of my U-shape, going back to parallel lines, U-shape, my co-interior angles were supplementary. Why were they supplementary? Because the lines were parallel. I could therefore say that 2x is equal to 120 degrees. Yes, 2 times 60, 120. Now, 
what is the question actually asking me? I've got to show that AD, AD, this side over here, is parallel to that side over there. How am I going to do it? Well, what I could say is that angle A is equal to angle C. We've worked out that that's 120 degrees. We've given that that's 120 degrees. Therefore, A, B, C, D is a palm. Now, that's good enough. We've got those two equal to each other. This whole quadrilateral is a parallelogram. Therefore, I can say that AD is parallel to BC. Now, guys and girls, what happened there was if I didn't know that interior opposite angles of a palm are equal, or if they're equal, then it's a palm, I wouldn't have had access to that question. That's why I emphasize the learning of the properties. Question two. What type of quadrilateral is ABCD? Well, sorry, we've already discussed that, and that is a palm Y interior opposite angles are equal. Right, on we go to question seven. In the diagram, PQRS is a parallelogram. Let's just remind ourselves what a parallelogram is. It's got opposite sides equal and parallel. P1 is 45, and PR bisects, bisects, cuts in half, angle R. Prove, and that's what we've got to do, we've got to prove that PQRS is a square. Now, this is the little thing that we have to worry about, this little square. What is a square? Well, it's got one interior 90, and all four sides are equal. If we can prove that, then it's a done deal. It's a square. Now, half the problem has already been solved because we've got opposite sides equal because it's a parallelogram. So let's go down and see what this problem gives us. Well, we've got P1 equal to 45. So by the power of adjacent angles, we can see that R2 is 45 degrees. And I'm going to write that down formally. We've got that angle P1 is equal to angle R2 is equal to 45 degrees. Why alternate angles? And why are the alternate angles equal? It's because PQ is parallel to SR. Just to remind you once again, vital that you give the correct reason. The second bit of information we had was that we had that R2 is equal in size to angle R1. So we've got that R2 is equal to R1, so that angle is also 45 degrees. And that was given to us. Now, if we have a look at the diagram, what have we got? We've got a 45 angle there, we've got a 45 angle there, which means that this is an, an isosceles triangle. So PQ is equal to QR. So we have PQ equal to QR. And why? Because triangle RQP is isos. It's isosceles triangle. What have we actually done? We've done two brilliant things. One is we've showed that all four sides, that side and that side and that side and the fourth side hiding up there, are equal in length. We've also shown that we've got one interior 90. We've shown that it's a square. So let me just write that up. So we can say, therefore, all four sides are equal. And we could say that angle R1 plus angle R2 is equal to 90 degrees. 
So therefore, P, Q, R, S is a square. Done deal. Let's just recap quickly. With it being a square, we had to show one interior 90 and all four sides were equal. We did that. Question done. Let's move on. Prove that A, B, C, D is a trapezium. Well, let's have a look at this little triangle over here. What's happening over there? Let's take that as starters. Oh, 30, 40, 50. How about that? Isn't that a Pythagorean triple? 3, 4, 5 was our primary. Multiply each side by 10, 30, 40, 50. It's a Pythagorean triple. If the Pythagorean triple holds, what does that mean? Got to be a right angle triangle. So in this case, angle E1 is right angled. Let's go back to the diagram and fill it in. E1 is right angled. What does that do for us? That says if we use N, going back to our parallel lines, those two are equal. Therefore, the sides are parallel. So what we're going to have to do is to write that up. Angle E1 is equal to 90 degrees by Pythag. Pythagoras, nice little abbreviation, Pythag. Angle A1 is equal to angle E1. Therefore, the line AD is parallel to the line BC. I'm taking the whole line, not, that, not just that little bit. Why can I say it's parallel? Because my alternate interior angles were equal. If AD is parallel to BC, therefore ABCD is a trapezium. There we go. I had to know that for a trapezium, all I needed was one pair of parallel sides. Last question. I have to prove congruency. There's the congruence sign. AFD, this triangle over here, I've got to prove that congruence to CBH over there. I'll talk it through on the diagram before we go do anything. Well, that side and that side are equal. It's given to us. Given. Wonderful. We also know that that's parallel. So this angle over here is going to be equal to that angle over there. Why are they parallel? It's a parallelogram. Also, it was given to us. A property of a parallelogram is that opposite sides are equal in length. So what do I have here? I've got side, angle, side, formal proof. I can show that AFD is congruent to CHB. Let's quickly write up that formal proof. I need to talk about in triangle AFD and in triangle CBH. I've got that AF was equal to angle CH and that was given to me. I've got that angle A1 is equal to angle C1 and that is because alternate interior angles why are they equal? Because AD is parallel to BC. And my last little bit is that side AD is equal to side BC, and that's opposite sides of a palm. So therefore, triangle AFD is very, very equal, or congruent, as the correct term is, to CBH. And my reason? Side, angle, side. I hope you've had fun. I hope you've learnt a lot. I've had fun sharing this with you. Get out there, learn your terminology, learn your properties. 
and make sure geometry is fun.